Good morning. How are you guys this morning? Yeah, I, just so you notice, I have relocated inside the house. I went out on the porch this morning, and um, it's a little breezy out there. And I just thought, you know, we have a perfectly warm house. We're going to go inside there. So we're in the house this morning, and we are right beside the fireplace. So, you know, I mean, granted, it's not on right now, but it's a gas log fireplace. It'll kick on here in a minute. It'll be fine. Morning, Dad. Morning, Shelby. Hope you guys are having a great day today. Um, we are today looking at Exodus. <laughs> Ed's looking at me. He just got back from the grocery store. We're looking at Exodus and we're looking at 2 Samuel. Good morning, Miss Sandra. How are you this morning? Glad you're here. Um, Exodus, we're looking at chapter 20 and verse 14. And 2 Samuel, we're looking at chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. So, good morning, Pastor Paul. Good morning, Miss Laura. So, we're going to look at this, and um, it asks a question in our book, right here in the front of our book. It says, whose marriage have you always admired? And I've been working on this lesson, of course, since last Sunday, and so it really got me to thinking as I went throughout my week this week of whose marriage have I always admired? And so... Um, we're going to jump into our lesson, but before we do, we're going to kind of pray over it and just ask God to lead us where he has planned for us to go today. So, here we go. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for this day, Lord, and thank you for the opportunities that you give us to look at your word, to actually dive into it and to dissect it almost, just to Try to figure out what you're pulling into our lives and what you want us to pull into our lives. And for the freedom to do that. For the freedom to meet in our homes and to meet in our churches and to meet really and honestly wherever we would like. And to just converse freely about you and about your son and about the Holy Spirit. We thank you so much for that, Father. And we just call on you to be with us as we go through this lesson, Lord. I ask that you block anything that may be of me and only let me be a vessel to bring what you want said. And just open my eyes to the lesson that you have for us today, Lord. And I ask all of this in your name. Amen. Okay, so we are going to get started. So like I said, the question that it kind of states in the beginning of our book is, whose marriage have you always admired? And like when I was growing up, my parents did not have a good marriage at all. And they um, actually uh, got away from each other when I was about nine. And so that was probably a good thing. Um, they were not good for each other. And my grandparents, who we ended up going and living with, they were older. And um, I mean, they were great people, but it wasn't really a model of a marriage that a young child would model marriage after. And um, we moved fairly frequently when I was young. I had, before I moved to Missouri, I had really never lived in one state longer than four years. And so I didn't really develop a lot of, you know, intensely close friendships. And so I wasn't really in other people's homes. So until I moved here, I never really had any marriages per se in my life that I could model. And, um, I just really didn't know what a marriage looked like. And so it got me to thinking when I looked at this question this week, whose marriage do I admire? And so most of the marriages that I admire are the marriages that I've come to know since I've lived in eminence, which has been a long time, by the way. But, um, the ones that came to the top of my mind were, um, ones that I'm sure everybody knows, but, um, Jerry and Benita Chilton. Huge admiration for their marriage. Um, Greg and Renee, they just celebrated 40 years of marriage last weekend. And so I admire their marriage. Um, my brother and sister-in-law, brother-in-law and sister-in-law, sister Linda and Dwayne Mahan, I admire their marriage and, and the model that they have set for us to follow. Um, Larry and Marilyn Wood, another brother and sister-in-law. Um... Even my sister, Kathy and Chris, I, I admire their marriage. Um, my brother, who's having some issues with health issues right now, 
he and Linda, I admire their marriage. Um, there's, you know, even like Amy and John, who are exactly our ages, mine and Ed's ages, I admire their marriage and I admire the example that they sent for, set for um, us to follow. Uh, there's just so many. Wendell and Glenna, um, TF and Joy Gale. Um, there's just a lot of people. Most of them are people in our church because they're people that I see on a weekly basis and I see them live life. And Pastor Paul and Laura, yes, that's another great example of a good godly marriage. Um, uh, I mean, there's just so many. I mean, there really is. Pastor Sam and Marlon. I mean, they have my heart. They have always had my heart. And so, and even younger marriages that I truly admire. Um, Jacob and Samantha, Sammy and Nick. I mean, I truly admire them. Um, there's just so many of our young people who are just starting out who are really, and I know that they've been married a long time, but trust me, in my eyes, you're still young people and you're still just starting out. I Trust me, I, I this just is the way it is. You're my kids. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of really good, good marriages. Rocky and Emily, great example right there. Um, so if you don't have someone that you're looking to, to base your marriage off of, or what a marriage actually looks like, I encourage you to look at any of those people because they are setting some great examples. Um, I, when our kids were younger, and I've told this story in Sunday school class, so forgive me, sorry about that. But when our boys were younger, Chris and Nick, um, at that time there was always like TGI Friday on TV and, um, it would be like one sitcom after another sitcom of just family shows. I mean, they started at seven and they usually went until nine and it would be family shows that everybody could just watch TV together and chuckle and laugh and they were good shows. Well, sometime, and there's like eight years between Nick and Allie, sometime between the time when Chris and Nick were really little and then the time when Allie came along and she started watching TV TV changed and I didn't even realize it. And one night we were sitting watching TV with Allie and the boys and I happened to notice every single show, every single show, nobody was married. Everybody was just sleeping with anybody. Um, there was someone who was either gay or lesbian or whatever the current politically correct term is on every single show and it got me to realize and I never even realized when the change happened it just did and so it made me try to be a lot more aware of things that subtly change that we really just don't even know that they've changed and I used to tell um, young people and young children I was like you know well Marriage is not like what you see on TV. They have a script. They're always nice to each other. They always resolve the fight in a good way. They always, you know, never cut each other down. They don't cheat on each other. They are good. It's just a, that's, that's, you know, marriage isn't like that. Marriage doesn't have a script. Well, now I try to tell young people, marriage is not like what, or should not be what you see on TV. It also should not be what you see in the movies because that should never be how marriage truly is. So in our question, whose marriage have you always admired? I want you to think about that this week. And I want you to think about who in your world do you have that you admire their marriage and how they live. And so with all that said, we're going to jump into our lesson and we're just going to get started. So if you have your Bibles, we are in Exodus and it's chapter 20, verse 14. We just have one verse. And then we're jumping to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. So if you want to stand up with me, that's fine. And if you don't, then that's fine too. So here we go. And I'm going to try to do this without dropping everything. Okay. Actually, this works out better. I'm closer to the light and I can see my words better. Okay. Second, or, um, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. Do not commit adultery. Okay. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. Oh, that is a good one. Yes, ma'am, Katrina Nichols, or Katrina Nichols Williams. Uh, Dwayne and Linda Nichols, that is a good marriage role model. I agree. 
Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. In the spring, when the kings march out to war, David sent Josh and his other officials and all of Israel, and they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and strolled around the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. So David sent someone to inquire about her. And he said, Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent a messenger to get her, and when she came to him, he slept with her. Now she had just be been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Afterwards, she returned home. The woman conceived and sent word to inform David, I am pregnant. Okay, so now we're going to kind of break that apart and see what exactly God is trying to to tell us today in this message. And just to kind of give you a little bit of a backstory, um, by the time the Israelites, and when, when we had our first verse in Exodus, this is when God has come down and is literally speaking to the Israelites himself, giving them the first Ten Commandments. They're not written on stone yet because the, the Israelites have been slaves for 400 years. And so God is literally telling them the Ten Commandments so that they have firsthand knowledge of this. And so, you know, humans by this time in the Bible have been, oh, they've just let themselves get so far away from God. Nothing is off limits for them. They they aren't even understanding right from wrong. They're not understanding how God wants us to live. Uh, Ed said from the kitchen, that's exactly where we are right now. And, and it is. It is where we are right now. And so we as Christians, we have to be so very careful not to let the outside world that we all have to live in, but not to let it pull us away from what we know God is calling on us to be, how he's calling on us to live. And, and it's hard because, oh, that outside world, oh, 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 it puts pressures on us and it just calls on us to do things. And so we're going to kind of look at this lesson today to try to find out how God calls us to battle back against it. Okay. So in our first part of our lesson, we have the commandment, do not commit adultery. And so the Bible, it teaches that physical intimacy should be reserved for marriage. And it should be reserved for marriage between a man and a woman. That's what God intended it to be. And something I want you to think about, when God made Adam in the garden and he brought in all of the animals and he was trying to find a partner for Adam. Matter of fact, I marked it in my Bible here so if I can see it because my light is not the best in here right now. Um, okay, it was from Genesis, uh, chapter two, verses 18 through 25. And it says, I may have to stand up again so I can get closer to the light. I really didn't realize that I could not see that well in here. Um, okay. It says, then the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper for him as a companion. So the Lord formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and he brought each of them to the man to see what he would call it and whatever the man called a living creature that was its name then the man gave names to all the livestock to the birds of the sky and to every wild animal but for the man no helper was to be found as his com companion sorry so the lord god came caused a deep sleep to come over the man and as he slept God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh of that place and then the Lord God made the rib and then the Lord God made the rib that he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man and the Lord and the man said this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh and this one will be called woman 
for she was taken from man. Okay, so I want you to think about this. My pillow fell down. So I want you to think about this. When God made a helper from for Adam, he did not make several helpers. He didn't, you know, he didn't make a whole bunch of different helpers and tell Adam, okay, you check out which helper you think is going to work best for you. And then you keep that one. But, you know, if, if you've had her for a little while and it doesn't really work out, you, you just bring her back. You just bring her back and I'll, I'll make you a new helper. Because, you know, that one was probably faulty or something. I, I don't know. No, that is not how it went at all. God made a helper for Adam. A helper. Not several helpers. Adam didn't get to test drive a whole bunch of helpers until he figured out which helper was his right one. No, God made a helper. And so, you know, I mean, there are adults who listen to this and, and maybe you've been divorced before. And I understand Ed and I have been divorced and then we remarried. So the thing to think about, though, is I want you to realize this. I was telling you that I moved around a lot when I was young. So I was born in Virginia and then I moved to North Carolina and then I moved back to Virginia. And then I moved to Indiana. And then a small town boy from Eminence, Missouri moved in right next door to me. Now what exactly do you think are the odds of that happening and just being a coincidence? It isn't. God had a plan for our lives and he worked to make it come to pass. We got off kilter and we got away from God's plan and we let ourselves talk ourselves into the fact that divorce was the only way to for us to go forward and while that's probably the biggest regret of my life on the other hand it also gives me a lot of compassion for people whose marriages are in trouble and whose marriages are struggling and I try very hard to be a um, counsel, a wise counsel for them. And I pray for them constantly because I understand how hard marriage is. And there are days, even today, I'm sure there are days that Ed starts out his morning saying, please, dear God, let me still be married to this woman by the end of the night. Because marriage is hard. You're taking two people and you're putting them together and you're asking them to do life together. Marriage is hard. But the thing we need to keep in mind is it's not as hard if you have God beside you. Nothing is as hard if you have God beside you. So whatever is going on in your marriage, in your world, whatever, you need to be sure that you're facing it as a team. You and God. And hopefully you and God and your spouse. Which this is a youth group so I know that you guys are not married. But I want you to be thinking about the day you will get married. The day you will choose a spouse for yourself. Because a lot of that thinking, it starts right now. Whether you want to think about it or not, you know, I realize some of you are in junior high and you are not thinking about getting married. But I've told this story in our youth class before too. I want you to think of yourself as a pie. I know you know where this is going. I want you to think of yourself as a pie. And you see this guy, this girl, and you're thinking, oh, I like them. I'll let them have a piece of my pie. And so you give a little bit of yourself away. Doesn't really work out. Doesn't really like your pie. So you find someone else. You're kind of on the rebound. You're needing somebody to, to tell you you are handsome or you are smart or you are strong or you are beautiful. And the next thing you know, you give another piece of pie away. They didn't really care for that pie. They'd prefer a different kind of pie. Before long, when you finally find the person that God has planned for you, you don't have as much of your pie left because you gave it away to people who did not appreciate it, who do not deserve it, and who did not take the time to take care of you the way that you should have. 
So I implore you, young people, I don't care what the movies say is the thing to do. And I don't care what your friends say is the thing to do. I'm telling you, get in God's word and see what he tells you is the thing to do. Because you need to respect yourself and you need to want to be the best person that God has planned out for you to be. And to do that, you're going to need to turn to him. And you're going to need to put him first and not looking to someone else to fill you up, to make you feel appreciated, to make you feel beautiful, to make you feel handsome, to make you feel special. That is God's job. God alone is going to fill you up from the inside out to let you know that you are beautiful. You are strong. You are smart. You are important. You are enough. You are enough exactly the way you are. And you don't have to change and you don't have to give anything away to anybody to, to be enough. You already are enough. Okay. So that's that part of the lesson. So we're going to move on and we are now looking at Samuel chapter 11, or second Samuel chapter 11. And we're looking at uh, verses 1 through 3a. So there's, there's a lot of things in this. There's a lot of things in this lesson. Because this is David that we're talking about here. This is the David that we just talked about uh, last week. Who had um, had the chance to kill Saul. And yet he was a good man. And he knew that that was not what God would want him to do. So he didn't kill Saul. And it was the man we talked about. Not this Wednesday, but last Wednesday, who faced Goliath as a child. He was like a 13, 15 year old young man. And he faced a warrior and won because he had God on his side. This is the same David. So it goes to show you that any of us, if we get away from God, we can make bad choices. Because that's this whole story is one huge bad choice on David's part. And so it says in the spring of the year when when kings march out to war. When kings march out to war. When kings march out to war. David is king by this point. But David didn't go out to war. David, next line, says David sent Jacob and his officers and all of Israel Think about this. If David had been where he should have been because kings march out to war, none of this story would have even happened. None of it. So think about that in your life. When have you let yourself not do what you should have done and it led you to doing something that you should not have done? Because if you had been doing what you should have done, you wouldn't be where you were. And that's exactly what happened to David. David did not go with his men to war, which he should have because he's the king and he's the leader and that was his job. But he didn't do it. He sent other people to go do his job. So that left David bored. So when he was bored, he found other things to entertain him. So then it says, you know, the men, the men that the king sent, they're out and they're at war and they have destroyed the Ammonites and they have besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. David stayed home. One evening, David got up from his bed and he strolled around the roof because he's bored. He's out taking a walk, walk on the roof because he's bored. Okay, so think about this. David is king. So where do kings live? Kings live at the top of the hill. And David's on his roof and he's walking around. And where are all the other houses? Down below him. So from his roof, walking around because he's bored, because he didn't do what he should have done. From his roof, he saw a woman bathing. A very beautiful woman. Okay, so flag on the play. We're going to hold it right here for a minute. This is another thing. Number one, men, 
that was to you. The first part was, you know, don't put off doing something that you should be doing because then you're going to end up doing something that you shouldn't be doing. Number two, women, this is to you. Girls, this is to you. Take some responsibility. Bathsheba, because that's the one that we're talking about here. You're going to learn her name in a minute. Bathsheba is bathing on the roof. I just told you it's a hillside. So if you're bathing on your roof, then there's a chance that somebody else on their roof can see you. Wouldn't you think so? So why would you do that? Why would you do that? And trust me, I am not a person who says that, you know, if you dress a certain way, you deserve a certain treatment. Or if you wear a certain item, you deserve this to happen to you or that to happen to you or whatever. That is not what I'm saying at all. That is not what I'm saying at all. But I am saying, use some common sense and respect yourself. Bathsheba was not respecting herself. Bathsheba knew that she was putting herself out there for a chance for someone to see her. And her husband's at war. So I'm assuming that she was probably lonely. And she was probably wanting someone to see her. And she was probably wanting someone to pay her some attention. And guess what? She got exactly what she was asking for. And so, you know, we, we, we just have to be careful about where we let ourselves go. Because it goes on and it says, David sent someone to inquire about her. Okay, so number one, look at this as being you are at home bored on a Saturday night. And so you open up your phone and you're scrolling through your phone and you see a picture. And I'm talking to girls and guys here because girls look at pornography just as much as guys look at, at pornography. And you see a picture. And your first thought, and David's first thought, should have been, whoa, whoa, turn that off, shut that, close the door, go inside, be done. But you don't. You swipe to the next picture. You go to the next scene. You look at the next show. That's what David did here. He saw, and he should have went inside the house. He should have closed the door. He should have pulled the curtains. Because keep in mind, it doesn't tell you in this story, but David was not alone. At this point in time, David had seven wives. He had ten girlfriends plus his seven wives. He had 17 women in his life that would have came to sleep with him any time that he wanted them. But David wanted someone new. David wanted her. David wanted the one over there. The one bathing on the roof. The very beautiful woman. He wanted her. And so immediately, he just sends someone to go ask about her. Right there is where it started. Right there where David saw the woman and didn't look away and then sent someone to inquire about her. He'd already made up his mind where this was going to end. So we have to be careful with ourselves. Where do we let our eyes go? Because where your eyes go is where your mind's usually going to go to. So what do we put in front of us that we see? And maybe it's not pornography, but maybe it's something else. Um, just your average TV show here lately. I mean, if you're watching it on like cable TV, there's just bleep, 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 because people are cussing and raining and raving because everything is a reality show now. If it's not that, then you're on streaming TV and they don't bleep anything, by the way. Nothing. You hear it all. So what are we letting our eyes and our minds go to? Because after a while, that seems like normal behavior. And that's where our heart goes to. So you have to guard your heart. And that's what David did not do. He did not guard his heart. He just went with whatever feeling he was feeling right at that particular moment. And as young people, you can't afford to do that. You can't afford to just go with your heart wherever it's going to lead you. You need to pay attention and guard it and only let in the good things. I have this highlighted down here at the bottom. It says, 
God desires intimacy in our relationship with him. Marriage was designed by God to be a reflection of the union we are to have with Christ. We are supposed to be with our mate exactly the way we are with Christ. Open, honest, nothing hidden, no lies, and truthful and loving. Therefore, the same level of purity and faithfulness we show in our relationship with Christ is to be shown in our relationship with our spouse, as well as in our relationships prior to marriage. David understood this, but when he stood on the roof and saw Bathsheba, he failed to guard his thoughts according to God's standards. David immediately let his mind go where he knew that it shouldn't go. And then we come to the next part of our lesson. And so now we're in 2 Samuel and we're in chapter 11. And we're in 3b to 5. Verses 3b to 5. So the messenger has went and inquired about Bathsheba. And now he's back with David. And he says, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now, even if David had let his mind go where it shouldn't have gone, the informer is kind of like, dude, this is somebody's daughter. This is somebody's wife. This is not somebody you should do this. No. I mean, I know where you're going here, but mm -mm, this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea. So think about this in your own lives. I mean, you know, and I'm kind of talking to my high school people here. You know, how many times have you seen your buddy's girl and decided, you know, I think she'd be better off with me because I think I'd be nicer to her and she's real pretty. Or girls, how many times have you been going out with one guy, but then you see this other guy and you're like, mm, I think I'd like to go out with him too. And maybe you just date both of them at the same time for a little while. You know, be really careful with how you let your mind go. Because wherever your mind goes, it's generally where the rest of you is going to follow. Okay, so it goes on and it says, David sent the messenger to get him, and when she came to him, he slept with her. Now, in the Bible, it usually talks about um, intimacy as, let's see here, it says, sexual unions in the knowing sense, Involve intimacy, sharing the deepest parts of themselves, of ourselves. A different word is used in verse 4. It does not mean to know. Instead, it says, he slept with her. Because it wasn't a beautiful thing. It wasn't something out of love. It wasn't something out of um, purity between a man and a woman. It was straight up sex. That's it. It was just, it was just having sex. And that was all there was to it. There was nothing about it that was lovely. There was nothing about it that was beautiful. There was nothing about it that was intimate even really. Because David didn't know her. He didn't even know her name until right before she got there. So he didn't know her. He flat out just slept with her. And that's all it was. And so, you know, don't don't fantasize in your head that, oh, David just saw her and it was love at first sight. And, oh, he just couldn't stop himself. No, that wasn't it at all. Because when it's done, she goes, she goes back home. Because it says he slept with her. Now she had just been purifying herself from her uncleanness. So that means she wasn't pregnant before she came and slept with David. Afterward, she returned home. The woman conceived and she sent word to inform David, I am pregnant. So, I mean, she didn't know she was pregnant the minute she left the castle. You know, she knew she was pregnant a few weeks or even months later. And so then she had to send word back to David. Hey, remember that night? And so, you know, that tells us a few things right there. We know that it wasn't love because he sent her away. We know that it wasn't love because he certainly didn't call her again. It wasn't love because he didn't care. 
and and that's just how it was left. And so I want you to think about the things that are in your life and I want you to, you know, understand that, you know, someone may think you're beautiful. Someone may think you're handsome. Someone may think you're, you know, all that in a bag of chips. And that's great. But that doesn't mean that you have to give yourself away to them. It doesn't mean that you can just have sex and it'll all be over and it's not, it doesn't hurt anybody. It's nothing, nothing to it. It's just an act. It's just a thing. Everybody does it. Well, it's very possible. Maybe everybody does do it. But maybe you need to be the one that takes a stand and that decides that, you know, this isn't the way I want to live my life. This isn't for me. And adult people who are listening, you know, it does need to be something sacred. It does need to be something that you share with only your spouse. Because that's the way that God designed it. And if you know someone the way they're calling on you to know someone here in the Bible, you are literally giving a piece of your heart. That's your pie. You're giving a piece of your heart away every single time until the only thing that you have left is one teeny tiny little bitty sliver that's left to give to that one special person that God designed for you. That God moved everybody halfway across the country to find that to move in right next door to. That's what God is. That's the that's the knowing that God has planned for you. That's the relationship that God wants for you. He wants you to be that special to someone because that's the relationship he wants with us. It tells us in the Bible not to have any other gods before him. Okay, so don't have any other spouses before him. Don't have any other person before him. Have only one God and have only one person. That's the message that he's trying to get to us. And I know in today's society that is not a... Uh, some people will say it's not even a realistic view. And that's fine. And, and a lot of times it isn't. And maybe you've had other people in your life. Maybe you've had one night stands just like Bathsheba and David. Okay. Today can be a new day. Even if you're married and maybe one or both of you have had extramarital affairs. Okay. Today's a new day. Today's where you start again. Today's where you decide from this day forward, this is how we're going to live. And that's... That's the glory of God's forgiveness. Today can be the day that you decide, this is how I'm going to live my life. This is how my marriage is going to work. This is how someday when I get married, my marriage is going to look. And maybe you've already given pieces of yourself away. It's okay. Today is a day to make a new start and change that and be the person that God is calling on you to be because he knows what you can be. He designed you. He made you the person you are. And like I said, I am not preaching to anybody here. We we have tons of, you know, spats and problems and issues and we're just human. Ed and I are just human people who live life and try to live life in the best way possible. And we fail lots of times. But that's the joy of it. God is there to forgive us and pick us up and put us back together again every time we turn it back over to him. And that's all I'm asking of you guys. That's all I want for you is I want God to be able to lift you up, put you back together again, and, and give, you, give you the joy that he, he, he wants for you. That's all. He just wants you to be with him. And he wants you to have joy and not happiness because happiness is, happiness is fleeting. Joy is something that comes from inside. So that's kind of our lesson today. And it's kind of all over the place. And even like last week when I was telling Ed about this, he was like, you have to talk about marriage? These are kids. Well, that's true. I mean, it is a youth Sunday school class, but there are a lot of adults that listen to this class too. And... I think all of us sometimes just kind of need that reminder that what God is calling on us and how God is calling on us to live because he has a purpose for us. He has a way that he wants us to live our lives and we need to be willing to ask him 
How do you, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? Show me the way. And so whether it be with your marriage or with your girlfriend, boyfriend, or maybe you don't have a girlfriend, boyfriend, maybe you don't married, that's fine. That's okay. God has someone and something planned for you. And you just need to pray to him that maybe you need to be pruned. Maybe you're not ready for your person. Maybe you need to work on things and prune things a little bit. Maybe God has your person pruning things on themselves before he brings them to you. Because you don't want somebody that's not ready for you when you're ready for them. And you don't want to rush it. You don't want to push it. You don't want to force something to happen. You want it to be beautiful. And you want it to grow sure on its own and have a life of its own. That's the kind of love that God is calling for you. That's what he wants for you. I have a little thing here in the bottom that I highlighted and it said, David's pursuit of Bathsheba had nothing to do with genuine care for her. David cared nothing for the sacred nature of physical intimacy. Instead, he ignored one of the main purposes and intentions of intimacy. The exclusion bonding that allows for knowing and being known which and which is cultivate cultivateness meaning of trust. When you are intimate with someone, when you sleep with someone, when you have sex with someone, when you, you know, have a relationship with someone, there should be a level of trust. There was no trust. There was no knowing. There was nothing. It was straight, simple sex. It was just like mowing the yard. It was just doing something. That's not what God wants for you. He wants you to have trust and peace and joy. That's the relationship that he's calling on for you. And that's the relationship that you should be searching for for yourself. And so my prayer for you is that you seek God's wisdom in your relationships. That you seek what he wants for you in your relationships. That you don't just put yourselves out there like Bathsheba so that whoever happens to be looking can pick you up. And you don't just go out looking for something like David and the first thing you see that catches your eye, that's where you go. That's not, that is not a relationship. That is not love. That is not anything that God has planned for you. It isn't. So pray about it. Ask God to lead you. Ask God to show you what it is that he has planned out for you. And then go with that lead. Go with where he's leading you to be. So that pretty much is all of our lesson today. Um, there's a little thing down here at the bottom that says, it's kind of a highlight, it gives highlights. It says, the same level of purity and faithfulness that we show in our relationship with Christ is to be seen in our relationship with our spouse. There's no, We're only supposed to have one God and we're only supposed to have one spouse. And some of us make terrible decisions and we end up in awful situations that we alone put ourselves in, whether we want to admit it or whether we don't. And there is a way out, but it, it's going to take some change. So my prayer for you this week is that, number one, if you're one of our youth students, that you find marriages to model. That you find people that you aspire to be like when you grow up. And if you're one of our adult people, I pray that you find people that you want to be when you grow up. Because I still look for people that I want to be when I grow up. So that's my prayer for you this week. So we're going to finish this up in prayer. And um, I am still noting, I haven't done it as much, but I am going to go back to noting uh, the people that are on our lesson with us. And we're going to be praying for you. Because I just feel like we're in a time that we need some prayer. I think our country needs prayer. I think our people need prayer. 
And so you're going to be added back onto our prayer list. And if you have a specific need that you'd like me to pray with you for, please feel free to either put it on here or you can message me or you can call me. Um, you can come to church with me. I'll be at the church at 945. We'll be doing in-person Sunday school. Um, you can sit with me at church if you want to. We would love to have you. So we're going to close up in prayer today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this lesson. I thank you for the challenges of this lesson, that it caused some deep thought and some deep reflection, um, a little bit of toe stepping on, uh, a little bit of hurt and a little bit of pain from past decisions that were made, and some renewal of giving my heart once again to you and giving my heart once again to Ed and just knowing that he is the person that you have planned for me, that he is the person that you have called on me to live my life with. And I am so thankful for second chances and I am so thankful for forgiveness, Lord. And I just pray that each person who is listening to this lesson today, Lord, that they turn to you, that they seek you, that they give their lives to you and that they ask you to lead them in whatever way you're seeing fit. And I ask all this in your name, Lord. Amen. Friend, I hope you have a great day and I will see you next week.